Ew. So, 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 so. How many classes of ships have managed to be subject to such a... Well, let's call it for what it is, a PR kerfuffle. That it almost in the middle of World War II caused the President and the Prime Minister of Britain to have to get involved personally. And it's all because of relationship management. I'm talking about today the Glen, Car uh, the Glen class, the first three of the Royal Navy's infantry assault ships or infantry ship, uh, landing ship infantry large, depending on the designation and the period. And well, yes, this class, this class managed to cause fun. So I'm going to explain this story, and then we're going to go through the class, uh, uh, through the history of the class, and look at their stats. And I'm going to let you work out what was the reality. So, later in the war, after they've participated in Torch and all sorts of operations in, in, off the coast of Africa, in Mediterranean, in Europe, all sorts of operations, including D-Day, have gone through all those not really permissive air defence-wise environments, they get sent out to the Pacific. Now... Three stories then start circulating why they're not being used for active operations. See, the first story that goes in is that they're just not good enough. They're not up to snuff. They're not. The Americans don't consider them viable. This is kind of strange. They've landed American forces before in non-permissive environments. They've got similar stats to their American counterparts. What's going on here? The trouble is, this gets disseminated by an American officer telling this to some of the crews, the sailors, not their officers of the ships, their sailors, in while they're drinking. And so it goes up and it ends up with an admiral hearing about this and going and talking to another admiral and going, um, so why... You told me that we're not using our ships because they're being used for strategic reasons and you're holding British forces back until we've got major British landing force involved. That's going to be the Japan operation, which makes sense. That's understandable. Uh, but now we're hearing this. And then the rear admiral goes, oh, no, 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 it's not that. That's what we've told our own crews. So they don't think we're not, we're preserving your lives over our crews. Unfortunately, another officer hears this and complains up the high command, which gets to Admiral King, who then complains to the president, who then claims that he's doing this because the Prime Minister, Winston Churchill, asked him to, which then gets via Somerville back to Winston Churchill, who's going, I did no such thing. This is one of many stories which happen in wartime, and this is one of the ones where, honestly, I would like to point out there are very few, if any, documents which actually substantiate it, or these, story, or these various stories around it. They are mostly post-it note, postscripts, notes put in people's memoirs, things like that, little asides which are forgotten, and which you sometimes have to combine together and work out, hang on, no, what landing ships are they going to be talking about? Oh, the only one options is the Glen class. The only ones which fit their criteria are the Glens. Because they're there, and they're there, and they've done that, and they've done that. But just think about that. Basically, in everyone's desire to manage communications, they presumed humans wouldn't do the most basic thing, and sailors especially... They wouldn't talk to each other. Admittedly, though, any officer who stands up in front of pretty much three ships' crews of another nation's navy and tells them their ships are terrible when they're your allies, I'm hoping didn't get promoted. I, I can't really find anything to substantiate what their exact name is. They seem to be an officer but not an admiral. Uh, it 
could have been of the rank of captain. That seems to they seem to be referred to as a captain, but there again, you can be captain of ship, but not a captain in rank. I do know that one. So it's sort of thing of yeah, um, that that's a just a fun little story. I think myself, when you go through it all and look for it, there was a strategic plan, and there seems to be a strategic plan quite a lot in the Pacific forces. We often talk about the king wanting to hold back the British because he didn't want the British to be involved in the Pacific War because of, you know, America, you know, has to win this war themselves and they have to do it themselves. But then you've got Nimitz, whose policy and quite a few of the British officers understand the policy as in Fraser, etc. And Vian, who's out there in command of the carriers, and Fraser, who's out there in command of the British Pacific Fleet, uh, basically understand it as the British are being held back while they bring forces through from where they've been fighting in Europe, and as they gather the forces together to take part in Japan, because of the considered increased survivability of British ships... Again, I do love it when people turn around to me and go, well, the Elastis class were designed for the Mediterranean, the Arc Royal was designed for the Pacific. No. Um, and if you think about it, the Elastis class were going to be very useful once you got started, if you were operating in places like the South China Sea or uh, closer to Japan, where you're going to be closer into land air ba enemy land bases and enemy air bases on the shore because you're going to be facing a higher threat environment. Uh, you, basically, the entire scenario is British are always designing their ships with the idea they're operating on the far side of the world from where they can be repaired. Think about it. If you are America and you need you have a problem with your ship in the Pacific, it has to go back, at worst, to the American Pacific coast. If you're British and there's a problem with your ship operating in the Pacific, it has to go back to Britain, which is in the Atlantic. It's a long way away, and it's not exactly a fun trip if your ship's damaged. Yes, you have dockyards and port facilities all around the world you can call upon, but they're not your major facilities. They can't do the largest repairs. So you want to minimize all the issues on your ships. So that's British design philosophy. And that, I think, features into then how the British are planned to be used in the Pacific Fleet. Because as they're growing their fleet, the Americans are more logistically homogenized. They are more they are more set up already out there. So they're doing taking a lead in the fighting efforts. And British forces are starting to come in, Okinawa, etc. They start to get involved. The carriers are doing their operations alongside. And what I see it as and especially a lot of discussions uh, seem to be around, and a lot of plans seem to be around, that when they actually do attack Japan, if they have to do an amphibious assault on Japan, the British forces, the British carriers, are expected to survive, have a lot longer in terms of survivability on station than their American counterparts, simply due to their better ability to sustain damage. Um... That's not a panacea. This is not saying the British ships are invulnerable and the American ships are paper mache. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is, due to the different positions of the strength deck, the Americans have the midways coming through, which are in a similar position. The British ones, all of theirs are in that situation. So there's a difference going on in terms of the likelihood of survivability from certain types of attacks and certain types of threats from the enemy. I think there's a similar thing with the wider British forces as a whole, because if you look at how they're being deployed and how the British forces are being concentrated, it seems to me like they are being held for the Japan operation. They're building up for the Japan operation, because you're going to need to do a massive operation. It's going to put D-Day to shame. The plans for invading Japan are absolutely enormous. You cannot overstate that. So, that's my view on why the ships are being held back. And all the rest is various circulation things, such circulation rumours, which got a lot more attention than they probably deserved, due to various people deciding they were going to be smart. Humans, we naturally muck up PR regularly. Anyway, infantry assault ships... Landing ship infantry large, the Glen class. 
all that in mind, let's go have a look at the ships. And first of all, of course, Shame's book plug. Thank you to everyone who buys the book. Thank you to everyone who's bought, who's bought the book and who's those people who bought the first edition, the second edition, all those lovely people. Thank you. Thank you to everyone who supports the channel by liking the videos, watching the videos, sharing the videos, all those stuff. That's brilliant. Commenting. That's always appreciated. Thank you everyone who's a member of the channel, who's a patron. All those. Thank you for your support. You make the channel possible. You make everything possible. So, this is HMS Glengar. Not exactly, when you're looking at it, a vibrant-looking warship. It's not what you think of. When you think of a warship, you're on a, a vessel of war, you wouldn't necessarily think of Glengarl. But she is. She's an incredibly useful vessel of war. In fact, when she's selected, she's selected exactly because of that. Now, there is something interesting. If you have a copy of this book, which is British Warship Design in World War II, select the papers, it has an interesting line. It says, the developments described in this paper began in 1940. And from then on, the ships used in the combined operations naval fleet fell into five main groups. And it lists out those groups and it talks about them. Now, what I would say is that he's not quite correct. Because what it should say is they began in this form in 1940. They get listed as landing ship, infantry, large, all those sort of things in this, uh, in, you know, and in the groups they're grouped in from 1940 onwards. The developments trace their origins back to World War One. They trace their origins back to the Dardanelles campaign. One of the things that's often underappreciated about the Royal Navy is that it's kind of like Iron Man. It learns from its mistakes. Yes, I am using a reference to a Marvel comic character, but there is a consistent meme about him, and it's just universal enough that I think it's worthwhile remembering. He, uh, Iron Man always learns from his mistakes. The Royal Navy always learns from his mistakes. These days, there are probably going to be more people who are familiar with Iron Man than there are with the history of the Royal Navy. So... It fits. Sad, but more not well in a, in a part. Now I've got this plan is going to be coming up later. But the interesting thing about the Glens and the Glen class is that the LSI largest were apparently officially asked for in nine, April 1940. Again, according to this paper. And it is a well written paper. It is a really well written paper. But one of the things you start to realize is then later on it says assault craft which they had to carry was the assault landing craft which had been developed towards the end of 1939. Well, that assault craft is Generation 7 of development which is going through the 1930s. This is all getting confusingly interesting. And if we go to... Hmm, I think it's in this side... Have I put it in here? No. Oh, yeah. You'll see that the ships were all completed in their mercantile form in 1938, uh, including Gungal, which is possibly actually completed earlier. There's a debate. There's a whole discussion as to whether it's completed actually in the beginning of 1938 or midway through 1938. Or is between those two, and was paused. What is noted is that they were all requisitioned in the 21st of October 1939, and were converted to LSLs and in service as LSLs by April 1940. In the case of Glengarl, so let's see again. That phrase was development described. This paper began in 1940. Oh my, so it's finished its conversion by April 1940. A conversion that started in October 1939, allegedly. But they didn't have the plans until the ideas of what they were building till sometime in 1940? If that doesn't add up to you, don't worry, it doesn't add up to anyone. The Royal Navy spends a lot of time in its post-war analysis, especially in meetings which are chaired by a gentleman called Lord Chatfield. And this particular paper was, produ was presented in, uh, in Scotland, September 24th, 1946, 
with Admiral of the Fleet, the Right Honourable Lord Chatfield in the chair. Remember, he's the first Sea Lord prior to World War II, who's very keen on the idea of 14-inch guns for the King George V. Spent a lot of time basically writing certain people out of history. One of those people is the third Sea Lord who spent most of his 19 and 1930s arguing with Chatfield. That would be Hend Admiral Henderson, who was third Sea Lord from 1933 onwards, and who was in charge of procurement for the, as third Sea Lord is in charge of procurement for the Royal Navy construction development. It's very, very interesting when you start looking through these papers. You start realizing that the reason you can take a several thousand ton ship and convert it as quickly as they do with plans to being able to carry 24 infantry landing craft, light landing craft, and three large landing craft, plus have all the facilities to accommodate all the personnel that are going to be stored aboard, and all the greater subdivision, etc. added into them, it's not just because of the amazing work of the Na Royal Navy constructors. It's because someone had ordered there to be ready-to-go plans for viable ships already in the works. Now, I would argue if there is a start date which is not directly introduced to the Darnells, it's probably watching the Japanese operating in China and going, Oh, look at how they're using their ships. Isn't that interesting? What can we learn from this? But I think, if anything, that's more like more than likely used as a argument to allow something they already wanted to do. I'm not saying anyone here is lying in this paper. I'm saying that the dates don't add up. And that while certain teams were, I do believe, brought into this in 1940, if you believe it ha all happens in 1940 and they're developing in 1940 to get, let's say, a plan assessed, um, let's say you implement a plan, even in wartime, you've got an idea, you have to take it up, the commander has to go to a Sea Lords, it has to go to the Sea Lords Committee briefing and possibly even Cabinet to get permission, especially for spending money, because you have to go to the Treasury, so they all have to sign off on it, and yes, they might sign off on it, but it's not going to be in days, that's going to be a process of you come with the, ship, uh, the, the the idea, you've got the allocated, spotted this a ship. Well, actually, no. You've got the idea. You go up and get permission first from your senior officer to go and look for sh viable ships. You find a viable ship. You then go up to um, first sea lord, uh, to the sea lords, and they will have to pause the construction of that ship or get that ship paused. All sorts of things done in order to acquire that vessel, and then that will have to then go up to the Treasury and to the Cabinet to sign off on it, and then you have to implement the conversion, and you're telling me you managed to get that done in four months. No. It doesn't work. So, yeah. These ships, they are a full-on PR situation. They are a full discussion. And... Before someone comes back to me and goes, it was World War II. They were moving more quickly than ever. No. Honestly, they weren't. Because there's only so quickly, uh, so, uh, so fast you can actually do some of these processes. If you consider the ship shape crew, okay? What I'm with, with in with Drac, Dr. Dan, and, Gar uh, and Garris the Brit. When we go to sea ships in museums in when we did Australia this year or Canada last year, there are four of us. Sometimes we are all off recording separately. It still took us three days to record something of the level of complexity as the museum in Sydney, the Naval Museum, uh, the Maritime Museum in Sydney. It's a wonderful museum. I highly recommend it. If you're conducting a survey of a ship, even if you've got the plans of how it was supposed to be built by, before you can start making changes, you have to make sure those plans are accurate. Then you have to work out the stability calculations. You have to do so many processes to go through. There is a time it's going to take, all before you can sign off it. And if you want proof of this, there are four sisters in this Glen group. There is Glen Gyle, Glen Lern, and of course, Glen Roy. And the fourth sister is at Breckenshire. 
Breckenshire is not completed and not transformed into an LSL and LSI. She's not. Why? She'd be useful. The Royal Navy would love another large infantry ship. No, they decide that while she's been built well enough to use, uh, they don't want to convert her. They decide her, her, uh, the, her internals aren't in the shape in which they would like to convert her. They're all built to the same plans. And again, this is not something which happens quickly. But these ships are in service fairly quickly. And the reason they're in service fairly quickly is because they're useful. They are really useful. Now, as you can see, they're first converted, uh, first supposed to be used as fast transport before being converted to LSSI. Uh, between uh, uh, sort of, and they uh, they have been fully converted by April nineteen forty. Uh, again, that's a uh, three four uh, that's a four five month job. So October nineteen thirty nine, they're theoretically going to be used as fast transport. The idea is to use them to rapidly drop personnel off in France, etc. But before you've even got to the fall of France, they are converting these into landing ship infantry. Why? Well, there's Norway. For starters, there everyone's looking at Norway and going, okay, this could be interesting. There could be something going on up there. That The Norwegian government isn't like the one in World War One. They haven't activated all their defences and gone to full alert. No, they're trying to play it nicely, nicely. And the British are going, that's a high-risk approach and it controls us trouble. And the Germans, well, we know what the Germans do. Both sides are planning to basically invade Norway for different reasons. The British are claiming they're invading Norway to protect Norway, but that's mainly to protect themselves, because if Norway falls, that's going to make the North Atlantic a far, far nastier problem for them to deal with in terms of blockading Germany than if Norway stays uh, stay, uh, is neutral or is an ally nation. And for the Germans, well, invading Norway is giving them a gateway to the North Atlantic. It makes the British job far, far more difficult. <sighs> Only government which doesn't seem to appreciate this is Norway, or uh, who are more concerned with not provoking anyone than they are with actually defending themselves. Heavily armed neutrality a la Swiss style probably would have been their best route. Why did the Swiss not get invaded during World War II? Pretty much because they made their borders a minefield. They really do make their borders a minefield. They are not a good border to try and cross. You are going to lose a lot of personnel. The conversion at its base point is about turning a ship which is a, a, a general purpose steamship. A general purpose steamship, I feel, is a good, a good thing to advertise it as. It's, you know, it's got... It's got quite good speed, it's got quite good accommodation, it's got quite a ability to carry quite a lot of load. And they're converting it into something which is going to be carrying an absolutely obscene amount of landing craft. And is pretty much a one ship. Oh, you've just lost control of your beaches. Well, it happens to all of us. And again, Davits being reinforced and rebuilt, uh, accommodations being redesigned, guns being installed, magazines having their spaces put in. All these things take time. And what I would say is the fact that these ships are converted so quickly, which is frankly a feat of engineering, in converting them as quickly as they do, do also to me suggests that if I was a slightly more cynical and wandering per soul, I might wonder if the Glen line, who seem to have, well, a supremely good relationship with the British Admiralty, might have designed their ships with the ability for conversion, 
into something which the Admiralty wanted them to be find useful. Now, the thing is, looking at the designs of the ships and where they have hard points, etc., I would not think armed merchant cruiser. Which does give you the idea that maybe, just maybe, there was an idea for these ships to be perhaps used as landing ships in the event of a war with Japan a lot earlier. Remember, the war with Japan is what Britain's always sort of planning for. The, the Royal Navy has... It's likely War Subnaro is Japan, because they're the ones who are po actively pointing guns at them. So that's, that's a fairly obvious likely war scenario. If you've got a nation in the world which you are regularly pointing guns at and they're pointing guns at you, you might not be shooting, but that's a that's going to be high on the risk register. That's why I always find it funny when some people write, well, they're preparing for Germany, or Germany was the biggest threat. Germany was a vocal threat nearby, yes, but they hadn't reached the, point of po the level of pointing guns at each other in 1939. The British had reached that with the Japanese in about 1936. And it gets iffy from about 1933 onwards, in that they are not pointing guns at each other, but they're pointing them in a not-too-dissimilar direction as each other. And that's mainly over China. And the breakdown in relations where between Britain and Japan following the naval treaties and the fall of uh, the collapse of the Anglo-Japanese naval uh, Anglo-Japanese treaty alliance because of various factors most including the fact that the British were not keen on the faction which was taking uh, was taking lead so they used the nice excuse of the Washington naval treaty to put the blame on the Americans for why they were uh, why they weren't renewing the treaty it's great it's the Americans fault it's not our fault might explain why the Amer relations with America and Japan got even worse more quickly. Whereas the ones of British, it was seen as, it's America that's come between us. Basically, sometimes countries behave like schoolyard bullies, and sometimes they behave like teenagers, where they don't want to tell each other the truth. So... They blame uh, two, when uh, one friend finds another friend is getting annoying. They blame a third friend or a, another friend, saying they have to spend time with them instead, or they don't like their relationship, or you know the classic thing of they they you know it's a, this it, romantic partners scenario, and that is it. That is literally what is going on. Countries are fun, so. You have taken the Glens of the Glen Line. All three Glens. Not Breckenshire of the Glen Line, but all the three Glens of the Glen Line. And you have converted them into these wonderful ships. It's a process, believe you me. It takes up yard space. And it's another thing to remember when you've got all these conversions going on and happening in 1940. Those, most of that conversion takes space. It takes up space in what would be normally used, talked about as fitting out yards. So it enters another thing which starts slowing down ship production. So if you've got ship, uh, it's one of the things which does actually support, to an extent, Churchill's deciding to pause capital ships and carry construction, in that it stops those large ships using up the larger berths in the fitting out yards, which you can use for conversions. However, Churchill isn't thinking about these ships when he makes that order, so he doesn't get it as an excuse. It's a lucky, lucky benefit, but it's not one he was thinking about. <sighs> Sorry, Churchill. There are decisions I will support of yours, but that was not one of them. And so we end up there vitals, which slide of which is terrible, so I'm going to fix that slide. That's better, isn't it? That is better. And you can see, I've put in where I've got details. Now, one interesting thing I found is that various books, I got an overall length of roughly 507 foot for Glengar, but I got 475 foot as perpendicular, between the perpendiculars. Okay, so that's sort of between the points of which are in the water versus the overall length. For Glenern and Glenroy, I just find a figure of 475, which does fit with the perpendicular length. So what I would think's happening is that 
I'm going to presume the Glengal is right with the overall length, and I wouldn't be surprised if the other two are roughly the same. I say roughly the same because there is that tonnage difference going on here. And that's, again, un not, unnormal between, not unusual between a class. And, again, this is the point. Breckenshire is a perfectly good ship. Perfectly good ship, but there's a difference between her and the others, and the three of the four sisters are... We'll take them for a less size. Breckenshire, no. Not suitable for conversion. Fairly similar beam. Fairly similar everything else. Compliments. 291 crew, roughly. Landing craft personnel board, 232. Again, roughly. Troops, 1087, officially. Now, why am I saying officially? That's what she's designed to carry if she's doing a long journey. If you're doing a D-Day run or a shorter trip, you might well choose to load up more. It's not going to be comfortable. But as you are carrying 24 landing craft assault and 3 landing craft mechanized, you have the abilities to get them that. You also have a fact that other ships might not be as fast as this one. She can do 18 knots. She can maintain those 18 knots. She has two diesel engines. They all do. Two diesel engines. Supplying two shafts with 12,000 brake horsepower. And that gives them a top speed of 18 knots. That's fine. I would also add that Glengyle has the commander equivalent of um, a corporal. While she's being fitted out. This is one of the reasons why she ends up with 12 20 millimeter in single mounts and eight pom-poms in two quad pom-pom mounts. That's uh, so an eight forty millimeter. The others I would say as well though, and also Glengar, these are their official weapon statistics. There is a very interesting picture I have found which could well be from a Glen class. It looks to me like it's from a Glen class, but it's not listed as being such. Where there are roughly, uh, I, I would say, three Italian AA guns, Army AA guns, positioned on her deck. And there is an Army officer smiling next to them. Who knows? The point is, though, this class has an extensive career. They really do, and they have the vitals and capabilities to go do it. They are good, solid ships. As your first large landing ships, they are a good place to begin. They really are. And so it's unsurprising that they have quite an extensive experience. They are used in Greece, they are used in Crete, they are used in Assyria... They're used in all sorts of operations, and as I said, they are used throughout the war. They have a very active World War II. So all these interest me, and I've studied a lot of them, and I knew exactly where the ships were when I was looking into this, and I was going, well, that's interesting. I know where they are on D-Day. I know what they're doing. I can find them. So I'm looking through my notes. I went, there's a gap here. And I checked books. And I checked the internet. I'm often quite thorough like that. I, I, I do check both because I presume that if I haven't got something noted down, it's probably because I've been an idiot. There is always an option. It's just the first rule of being a good academic historian is presuming you have made the mistake and going back and checking your work. If you find out you haven't made a mistake, then woohoo! Now you have to do, especially if you're British, the more difficult, the even more difficult thing of telling someone else they have made a mistake. Traditionally difficult for British thing, but let's be honest, I'm quite a blunt British person, so it's the reverse for me. It's quite easy for me to tell people they've made a mistake. It's very difficult for me to tell them, or tell them it in a way which is actually considerate and not doesn't sound like I'm being rude. I work on that one. So, one of the things you find when you start looking around the task forces and the various forces involved... And the fact that you look at the Centre Task Force, the Eastern Task Force, they're both the Royal Navy Task Forces for Operation Torch. 
And then you look up the Western Task Force for Operation Torch. And you can find quite decent orders of battle for the Western Task Force, listing the ships and exactly what they're doing, where they're doing, which ships are going where, and how they're working on it. But the Centre and Eastern Task Forces, you really can't find a good list. We, I can tell you what ships they had in them. I can. It's, you know. The, the Western Task Force was all United States Navy vessels. Three battleships, five carriers, seven cruisers, 38 destroyers, eight fleet minesweepers, five tankers. I should point out that those carriers were, uh, four of them were Santi, Sangamon, Shengenagar, and Suani, which were Sangamon class escort carriers, all supported by USS Ranger, which, frankly, the Americans were going, Woohoo! We can actually use it in operation! The British were going, Everyone stay very, very safe around that ship. Then you have the Central Task Force, which was two carriers. This is Trowbridge's force. Uh, two cruisers, two anti-aircraft ships. Again, it's an RN ship escorting a landing force. Uh, we know the assault force of the Western Naval Task was roughly 91 vessels. But the Central Task Force, it just says... Landing Force, Eastern Task Force, Vice Admiral Sir Harold Burra, Rear Admiral, Vice Admiral, he's changing this time, so it's fine if you're getting a bit confused. Uh, two aircraft carriers, three cruisers, a monitor, some destroyers, some submarines, and there's a, there's a covering task force as well. So there's a lot of ships there. But the landing forces, despite us knowing they're carrying literally thousands upon thousands of personnel, are not really that well listed. We don't really know, unless you've managed to find specific examples in books which tell you which ship that unit was on, they don't link up. Which is really tra is strange, considering how important Operation Torch was. When you consider Operation Torch is this very important mission, it comes... After, of course, the, the very big disaster of the app, and that was a problem because that had shown that, frankly, invading a port in Europe was not going to be a good answer. So you needed to be, have the infrastructure built to go with you, so you didn't have to go and seize a port city. Because port cities were fairly easy to predict and quite heavily secured and had quite a large number of troops in them. So, sorry, Comrade Stalin, we can't go in that way. So, North Africa, Operation Torch, is a test of combined operations. It's a test of the two forces working together. Remember, one of these task forces is fully American. Yes. Two are British ships with either a mixture of American sol either all American soldiers or some American soldiers, some British soldiers on them. And you've got all those different problems filtering into it. And right in the heart of them. Right in the heart of, heart of Glen class. Providing a huge amount of lift capability. A huge amount of lift capability. And they carry on doing this. They're, they're doing this through all of the war. Uh, individual operations, they show up. They get to their range spots and they disgorge troops. They're not doing thing, fancy things. They're not charging around engaging an enemy. They're not providing air defense. They're not providing, you know, fleet screen or anything like that. No. They sit in the convoys, they go to where they needed to, and they offload troops. It sounds almost mundane. Apart from when you realise these are nearly 10,000 ton targets, which aren't moving, are carrying thousands of personnel, and they're offloading them all. They are prime targets filled with stores and troops and carrying a huge proportion of the landing craft for that assault. 
and they do it well. They really do. So, summary. Well, as I mentioned, these ships survived till... Well, possibly mentioned. These ships survived till July or August 1946 in the service. Then they are given back to the Glen Line. They have been valuable ships which have served throughout the war. They haven't been... Well, to restate a point in a similar way, but slightly different, they haven't been anything flashy. They haven't done any daring actions in the face of enemy destroyers or anything like that. No, what they've done is they have formed a core competency, part of operations, ex amphibious operations, for a wide, wide array of operations. They have been a core capability. They have been something which formations have been built around. They have been something which has been useful. They are conversions. And honestly, pound for pound as conversions, they are friggin' useful. And today's question, which I will say before I get to Minasonomy, is literally this. Yes, you could convert a modern merchant ship to do this job. The question I would ask is, would you? Would you want to? You see, there are cruise liners wandering around the world which have a lot more tr a lot more troops aboard than this vessel does, but they go a lot faster than this vessel does. And that's in an era where, whilst there are aircraft around, there aren't missiles. And there aren't nuclear-powered submarines which could keep up with them. Often, going at high speed means that by the time a submarine spot, when a submarine spots them, they'll be well out of the, the zone where the submarine could actually get a kill. So the submarine can't move. You know, but, you know, basically the time between, we spot it, it's going at maximum speed, which is 30-something plus knots, and to get it, we spot it when we're here, there, over there, we can get to there, they will already be there, because we can go seven knots on the water. We could surface and go 17 knots, but there might well be an escort, and even their own guns on the surface might actually do the necessary damage before we get into range, because remember, even a cruise liner is a more stable platform than a submarine is. Fun. Or rather, even a liner is a more suitable platform. But this is a stock standard merchant ship. Yes, I would argue I have a strong suspicion about the long links between the Glen Line and the Royal Navy, and I have a strong suspicion about exactly how quickly these vessels are converted when they decide to convert them, and about exactly how quickly all those things are processed, even with the pressure of war and the fact that these things are being ordered before even the fall of France. It's happening. It's taking place. They aren't commissioned necessarily immediately after they're converted. Um, some, they, they sit around, wait for a captain, wait for uh, various officers. Or, no, we don't even have realistically a complete list of that's on there, the commanding officers. If we consider for Glenroy, we know she's got Captain Retired, Sir Fra James Francis Paget, in July 1940 as her commander. And he'll be in charge until May 1942. With Glengarl, she also gets Captain Retired, Gerald Berkeley Villas, in July 1940. And Glenurn theoretically gets Captain Lawrence Bernard Hill in August 1940. But, all of them seem to have had other officers attached to them before that. And also, if you think about it, the only operation which, was, which they could have really got involved in earlier than late 1940 is Norway. And they weren't going to be ready in time for that, because you'd have had to start the conversions a lot earlier. There was also time that was taken in the conversion. The bulk of the conversion was done quickly, but some of the weapons fits, some of the actually getting the guns, and getting the crews for those guns, took time. Took time to train them up, took time to make them viable. They're good ships, though. 
they do well in the Pacific, they do well in the Mediterranean, they do well in the North, well, in the Atlantic and in the Channel. Wherever they are sent, they do well. They do well in the Indian Ocean. They are good ships, but again, would you take an average, even a slightly above average, merchant ship of the day and want to convert it into a, a something like this? Because think about how much of your ability you'd be putting into that one hull. I would argue that there's actually a good reason to keep these back in the Pacific war is another reason is that they are so much capability in one hull. You are risking something which can carry 24 landing craft and free landing craft assault and free landing craft mechanized in one hull and a thousand oh nearly 1100 troops. That's a lot to risk. Okay, in World War Two, you have lots of them, but if you consider a modern merchant ship, which is many, many tens of thousands of tons, we took a container ship and converted it into an equivalent level lift capability. You could be taking an entire brigade, maybe even an entire division, depending on how you set it up, on one ship. Risking all that on one ship? That's a lot of eggs in a very small basket. Valuable ships then. Useful ships. Viable ships. These ships in World War II are product of much research and much study done in these war periods, but they are also shrouded in a fairly large chunk of mystery. I would argue because there is a lot of confusion in the early war. There's a lot of confusion of the timelines of the early war. And there's a lot of people who... How do I put this? Profit more from the idea that Britain is unprepared for war as it excuses some of their actions, than admitting that Britain was more prepared than it necessarily looked, and had those preparations, they just hadn't acted on them. They hadn't acted on them. Britain had ideas for amphibious ships prior to World War II. They had ideas for ships they would actually have liked to build. They didn't build them, so they had to rely on conversions until war had, was well underway. Britain had ideas for its sloops and its small ships, its escort destroyers and corvettes and all those vessels. You know, I've done videos about this on this channel. But they weren't... They were ordered. So the designs were finalised in 1938. They were ordered in 1939, but war begins in September 1939. Why? They were, all, were they ordered so late? Well, they were believing that war was going to hold off to 1942 and, well, getting the Treasury to part with money even after relaxing the 10-year rule in technically in 1932. Hence the 1942 signal for the armed forces that war was supposed to be after 1942. So the 10-year rule ends in 1932. Okay, so war's going to happen soon. Well, that hadn't actually been written properly relaxed till 1937. It's only in 1937 that the Treasury really starts being <clears throat> ordered to open the moth-infested thing known as the checkbook. So that means when you're looking at real military expenditure and real naval expenditure and real procurement in terms of preparation for war, that starts in 1937, and war breaks out in 1939. Look at what's ordered in 1937. Look at what's ordered in that financial year. And then look at what fights World War II. And then think, if they really had 
really had broken open the checkbook in 1932, how much other things would have been ready. I have a suspicion, though. A strong suspicion. And I've mentioned this before. The Glens are good ships. They're valuable ships. They're viable ships. Uh, I know I keep saying that. But they're also slightly suspicious ships. They are selected so quickly by the Royal Navy. The designs are so already there. Uh, you know, the, everything processes so quite so smoothly. And the fact that they're actually disappointed that Breckenshire doesn't make the grade leads me very, very suspicious about those links. And I can't prove it, and so that's why I'm talking about this video. I am honest. I cannot prove it. I will honestly say, I cannot prove it. But there is just so much which lines up so perfectly that either someone is the absolute luckiest, jammiest dodger ever made, or someone's been stacking the deck. And I'll leave that to you to think about. So what else do we have coming up? Well, next week, it's supposed to be the USN Aircraft Squadron System. The book still hasn't arrived that I want to use for that. So conception, operation, conclusion of HMS Furious is looking more and more likely. But if the book arrives tomorrow, I will try and get it done to order the, carrier, the aircraft uh, the squadron system. If it doesn't, then I apologize. And I apologize. But I'm also going to keep my promise. And my promise was to talk about MV Breckenshire, the sister which doesn't make the grade. And she spends most of World War II, well, her World War II, up to the 27th of March 1942, she spends her World War II doing the Alexandra to Malta run. She is converted by the Royal Navy into a fast tanker. 18 knots makes her a fast tanker. There are some sources which list her as only being capable of 14 knots. Which I find interesting, because she is pretty much an identical sister to these other these ships, which all do 18 knots. And I look for other, and there are some sources which list her as being able to do 18 knots, and some which list her as doing 14 knots. And as she's being used as a fast oiler, 18 knots is where she should be. Now... There are reasons she could have ended up being only able to do 14 knots, and therefore they could those those people claiming down in sources could be right. I'd say she's probably built to at least be able to do 18 knots. Whether she's still doing 18 knots three years into well, two and a half years into a World War II, is a completely different matter. But I think she's probably still doing it. Probably still at least theoretically capable of 18 knots. She's on a run, another run to, from Alexandra to Malta. She gets damaged. And this is where it's fun, because she's listed as being sunk on 27 March, but she doesn't sink. Well, it's a different thing. She gets damaged. And as she's thinking, they keep her afloat long enough to get her into Grand Harbour. And then she rests on the bottom in Grand Harbour, and they get her, uh, get her precious supplies, her precious cargo, off her. They can't refloat her, they can't reuse her. From Grand Harbour. She is used for other things in Grand Harbour, but MV Breckenshire, her war ends on the 27th of March 1942. And she's a good ship. She made it. Not sure if I'd say she was sunk or not, though. And of course, the whole way through, I haven't talked about what definition these ships are. They are, I would call them fast tramp steamers, but officially it's, they're designated as cargo liners. But of course, by this point, she is a fast oiler. But still carrying cargo as well. And the others are all carrying cargo and a lot of personnel. Cargo liners. 
a uniquely good ship for conversion, as you will see probably in some other videos that will come up in the key ship series at some point, for conversion into amphibious warfare vessels, because they're everything you need. They carry cargo, they have big cranes for launch of landing craft, and they have accommodation, hotel facilities as we call it, uh, for the support of personnel. Yeah, everything's good. Everything is good. Thank you very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed. I hope you found it interesting. And take care. And sorry this was late. Um, we have a double oven hob unit cooker, as it's called, as it tends to be called in the UK, or at least in my part of the UK. And it had decided to break. And finally, the engineer came this evening. And I'd uploaded this video, a video, a version of this video. But for some reason, the second half of it was absolutely corrupted. So, stop that going out. Dealt with the, uh, dealt with the gentleman who's come to visit. And have re-recorded, as I visited, the second half. You can probably tell where I've had to switch in and go, Hello! Hope you enjoyed it. Hope you found it interesting. And thank you for watching. And while I remember, tomorrow evening, it will be Tillman. It will be Tillman. And what a Tillman-Washington naval treaty would have been like. That absolute mm, of a man. I think I would use the, fra uh, the I think I would use the uh, phrase um, frigating assault hotel um, <laughs> to describe him on his best days. But. Thanks to the Charleston Navy Yard, which he got built, and his view that providing gainful employment through that from the government provided him with gainful employment as a senator. He was a, he was very he was pro navy. He was pro navy. Thank you very much for watching. Take care and have a good day. And hope you enjoy tomorrow's video, which should hopefully be on time.